So we have chapter 10, and chapter 10, we're only covering all today, 18 verses. And this is kind of like the last words, if you want to put it that way, of all the arguments the, the, the writer, the author, has been trying to build. You know, we've, we said it almost every time uh, in this, in this uh, study, we have said that the book of Hebrews was meant to encourage some Jewish Christians that were falling back, or at least thinking of falling back, and they were being encouraged. You know, many people will tell you, oh, the book of Hebrews is to show you the superiority of Christ, and Christianity and his sacrifice are sanctuary. And it's true, but that's really not the purpose. The purpose is to encourage Christian, Jew Christians are weak in the faith at this time. And he did that by means of showing them how Christianity, Christ, our new covenant, everything that we have is superior than, than back in the, old, in the old law, in the old covenant. So, so we have... You know, so many chapters that we cover, uh, some, so, so many great things, and I hope that you guys are getting the point that the, the Apostle is trying to bring, us, bring to us through these chapters to understand that what we have is it's quite amazing. It's quite amazing what we have, but it's quite amazing to understand what they had, to see, you know, to see what, they, what God, how God worked through the law, through Moses, you know, understand that like in Romans, we saw that God really made a promise to Abraham way before the law, 430 years to be exact. God had a promise, and he promised to Abraham, through your seed, singular, you guys will be blessed. And that was Christ. And we learned that in Romans, we can learn that in Galatians, that we're studying right now in our Bible study in, in Sunday mornings. And it's amazing to understand that and to know that. But now it's amazing to understand why did God go through all the things that he went through uh, to show us uh, what needed to be done. You know, I, we said last week, I said it that, you know, all the blood and the things, we always hear blood and sacrifices and people, of course, paint that, paint that really bad outside, you know. They tell people call it a, a bloody religion, if you want to call it that way, people say that. But we really, you know, we, it's good to understand that we understand why God did that, or what was the, the purpose of it, so we can actually not only understand it and be clear about it, but to be able to explain it to other people as well. Why so much blood? It's good because we said it last, last week, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Always keep that in your mind, because that explains very clearly, I think more clearly than any other passage, Leviticus 17, and, chap and verses 10, 11, 12. And tells you that it is blood because life is in the blood. And that's what if you sin, Christ, God says you would die. But of course we talked about his mercy as well. And, and aren't we glad that he is merciful? That when we do sin, we don't really perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish. That's the truth. From the very beginning. And he knew it. And we, we have, you know, that before the foundation, we said this many times, before the foundation of the world, the lamb was already slain. God knew what was going to happen. When God says, this is going to happen, it's done. Right? It happened. Before the foundation of the world, God already knew Christ had to come. And we, we'll see that today. But the apostles start closing in those arguments that he made to show them, to show this, this uh, discouraged Christ, Jew Christians um, that, listen, we, we have something superior. We do have the word of God himself came down to this earth. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God has spoken. He spoke many different ways, but he's spoken now. We have that. So let's not, let's not, uh, what's the, 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 the word he used in chapter 2? Neglect. Let's not neglect what we hear from the New Testament. Because we have the words of Christ. And Paul tells us that we have we're so blessed that we have the mind of Jesus. If you have the mind of Jesus, if we have it, that's pretty cool, pretty amazing that we do. We have a, it's a blessing that we sometimes, you know, don't think about. We have the mind of Jesus. If we have the mind of Jesus, we have the mind of God. Because Jesus is God. So it's, it's quite amazing when you think about it. So that's why it's so important to read the mind of, the mind of God. Because the mind of God is not going to come into your mind unless you read it. Some people, you know, think otherwise that by a mirac you know, miraculous 
things or happenings, you'll get all the, you know, or just by praying, you know, we have to pray, but we have to work. We have to work at our own salvation. That means reading, that means studying, that means, you know, going the extra mile, if you will, getting strong in, in, the, in the solid food. Get up from the, from the bottle, leave that milk. And he said that in Hebrews, right? He was telling, tr trying to talk to them about Melchizedek and how to take a break and tell them, listen, I can't talk to you too much about him because unfortunately you guys are not where you're supposed to be and that's why you're weak. But we, we want, so we want to hear that. We want to learn from that, that we are, we are supposed to be studying the Word of God, especially the New Testament. And I'm no, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying don't study the Old Testament. Because if you, if, you if you didn't have an idea of the Old Testament, the book of Hebrews is one that would be like, what is he talking about? So if you have a good idea of the Old Testament, that's going to help a lot. But, you know, we have this complementary or commentary on the book of like Leviticus and Exodus. And I said that before, read those, those books as well. So we have those blessings. And he's been showing, you know, on and on about not only Christ, the word we have, the better message. Because Christ himself delivered it, not the angels. The angels was, it was binding, but Christ, if that was binding, imagine Christ's message. That's what he says. Then he talks about, shows how he was, he gave, he gave us a better rest, he says. If Joshua had given him rest, why would, it, why would it talk in the word that there's another day of rest for the people of God? That's another argument he made. So Jesus gives us that true rest. We can see it from our works because Jesus has done it all. Doesn't mean that we're not going to be righteous and godly in this, in this present world, but it means that Christ has, has, has earned our salvation. He has earned our, our justification. We can be righteous because of what Christ has done. And we know that. And he put that really clear. He talked about Moses. He talked about the old covenant, the old law. Not only the old law, but the whole covenant that you know, God, God f found fault in them, not in the law, in them, because they didn't keep it. So, but, but God knew that, of course, and he promised to Jeremiah, we read, he read a little bit in, in this session, but he promised to Jeremiah, I'm going to give you a new covenant. All the way from when Moses got that covenant, we learned that in Corinthians, remember, we learned that Moses used to cover his face because he knew that he was, what he was speaking about was passing away. Right, right, right when, when he first started preaching, the old law, the, the old covenant, that was already passing away. He knew. So he covered his face so people wouldn't see him. But not the new covenant. The new covenant is what he's been, been speaking now. And, and he also used the, the, the old covenant and the old sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary. He explained to them very clearly, chapter 9, chapter 8, 9. Listen, you, you go, you see, what you had was a shadow. And that's what we have today. This, this is how, kind of like the closing words about all the arguments that he's been trying to make uh, before he starts uh, three and a half chapters of exhortation and encouragement. So what's coming after today of this, this week are great, is great encouragement, uh, great exhortation. If we really pay attention, remember, I remember we told you we have to heed. That's just a little more than listening. Uh, you know, he, people make the difference between hearing and, le and listening, right? And that's a great difference between those. Oh, I hear you. You hear that noise, but are you listening to what is being said? But there's a little more when you talk about heed. So that's when you really have to pay close attention. So, so listening goes square, let's put it that way. Listening square. So that means that not only are you paying attention to what is being said, but you're letting that transform your your inner person. And then that, that would guide your, your thoughts, your inner thinking, your heart, and that in turn will change your behaviors. It has to. So it's, it's, it's like Paul said in Romans chapter 12, I believe, he says there's an inner transformation that goes when we heed. So I would, I would, I would um, highly advise that from today on, you know, even heed even more the exhortation and encouragement that the apostle is going to start talking about before, rather after chapter 10 in Hebrews, verses 9, 19 and on. For about three chapters, he's going to talk about some great things. But today we have this last, last uh, words. And, and the first thing he says here, let's see if I have the chapter here. Yes, Hebrews 10. Uh, I think I have it. 
Now, one second. Uh, in the first, first couple of verses there, he talks about the shadow. It's about shadow. He says for uh, verse 1, hold on. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, he says, and not the very image. So, old covenant, old law, old dealings, everything in the Old Testament was a shadow, not the very image. And that's important to understand because it's, it's, think about yourself, you know. Let's say you're in the corner of a building and you see someone coming, you know, and, and you see a shadow and you see some. That gives you an idea of how big the person is, whether it's a person or not. It gives you an idea of seeing the shadow, but you can't see who's coming. You know someone is coming. When you're looking at that corner of the building, the shadow is coming. You know someone's coming, it gives you an idea. It's the same thing that's happening here. He uses those two words, shadow and the actual image. Once you see that person, then you can see the image. And the, the shadow is still there, but you, you actually see. And that's what happens with Christ. With the law, with Moses, with all the, those ideas, you saw a shadow is coming. And he, he said it too. He promises, I'm going to give you a new law. But when Christ came, which is what he's been trying to say, when Christ showed up, that's the image. That's it. He is the image. The, 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 he's the pure. He's, he, he gave us an idea, a perfect idea of what God looks like. And not, all, not in the physical way. Remember, God is a spirit. But he gave us an idea of God's, um, his intentions, his, his character. I mean, he put it into flesh so we can actually see it. Because we know it from the Psalms and the Proverbs. and We know God is great. And we know God is a provider. God does, I mean, he's done so many things to his people for the history of the world. But when you see Christ, when he comes into the picture physically, not only do you see the image now, but you have an example of how God really is and how he really wants us to be. That's the greatest too. Because that's the, we don't have the, the image just to look at it. Remember, that image is a mirror that we have. That if we look at it, we can actually start seeing ourselves there. And that's the idea. But he says, you know, we, in, the, in the old law, you had the shadow of the good things to come, not the very image of the things. And it says, the law can never, with the same sacrifice, as he's been talking about this forever, he says, which are offered continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. They don't miss the point there. That shadow could not make those who approach God Perfect. All the sacrifices that were offered uh, daily, in a year by year, day by day, they couldn't do it. So, so again, we have all the shadows and things. He says, for, when, when, for then would they have not ceased to be offered. Of course, they have. For the worshipers, once pur uh, purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. That's another key there. Approach, perfect, consciousness, consciousness of sins. That's, that's a key for us. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder every year, a reminder of sins every single year, for it is not possible. And this is the key of this little three verses here. It was not possible for the blood of, the blood of bulls and goats uh, could take away sins. Not possible. Insufficient. So that's the first thing he does. Animal sacrifices, insufficient. Now Christ's death fulfilled God's will. See, when you think about this passage, this is an, it, to me this is an amazing passage. It's Psalms, he's quoting Psalms chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. That's what he's quoting here in this section. But, and that's David, by the way, that's David speaking about himself. You know, in Psalms, you go to Psalms 40, and that's David speaking about himself. But the writer here tells us that what that really meant was David prophesying about Christ as well. Which is an amazing thing. I told you before that everything is about Christ. Everything in the whole Bible is about Christ, right? And this is a demonstration. When you read that, that was David talking about himself. And it was true, too. It just makes it even more amazing. But he says, uh, therefore, when Christ came into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering God did not desire. And then he says, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. This is Christ speaking about his father. Then I said, Christ said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And then he has a little uh, thing there. It says, As is in the books, in the volume of the book, it's written about me. 
So Christ says, you know, sometimes, and I know, I heard Gordon talking about this, this verse a lot. And says in Samuel, 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 1 Samuel chapter 15, and uh, verse 22. It's a story of uh, when, when uh, Saul was given the directions to go to Amalek and, and kill everything in that city. Everything, because they have done some, some really bad thing to Israel. And God said, you go in there, you kill everything. From, from, I mean, from the biggest to the smallest. From all the animals, everything he was instructed. Very clear instruction. But when he went to, to the king, you know, he, he spared the king. And then he spared all the, the best of the spoils. You know, all the uh, lambs and things like that. He took the best and took it in. He made those decisions. You know, and that's not the, the lesson here. But when... When Samuel, Samuel hears, hears about it, he approaches, he of course disobey God. God was very clear, simple. This helps us too to understand that when God says something, he really means it. If he tells you do this, well, do that. Don't do less, don't do more. Do what God says and you will be safe. But Samuel, uh, Saul took it upon himself to, to spare the king and to and to leave some you know lambs and things for sacrifices you know he got he had good intentions he wanted to offer to God some things so he nah God says kill them all and that would have that would have been better that would have been obedience and that's what Samuel said here verse 22 has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord which one is he is he has great delight behold he says to obey is better than sacrifice. I know, I know Gordon probably knows not why I say that. He always uses that verse. He finds a way to use it. And it's good. Because that's what God says. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So the point is, God was not pleased with all this burnt offerings and sin offerings and things like that. He just was giving them the shadow of the things that was going to happen when the lamb, the actual lamb, was slain. Okay, but when you read that, you say, well, why he say that? To obey is better than sacrifice. Well, if we obey, there was no need for death. If we obey, Christ didn't have to come in the, in the flesh and die. So that's absolutely, he rather has obedience rather than sacrifice. You know how much he had to suffer to see his son on that cross? If you're a father today, think about that. If you have kids. Seeing your son being killed, horrible death, for something he did not commit, okay? Because if, if the, your son or daughter did whatever, and they deserve it, it's still going to hurt like crazy, I'm pretty sure. But they, they broke the law, whatever. No. God had to see and look the body that he prepared for his son, his word, he had to see that, experience that being killed, a horrible death. Imagine what he felt as a father. Amazing. So absolutely, he, re, he rather have obedience rather than sacrifice. And then he said, verse 23, for rebellion, which is what we do, what we do when we disobey, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as an, an iniquity and idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has re rejected you from being a king. That's a great story there. But let's go back to Hebrews. And when Christ says that, and then he says in verse 8, chapter 10, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burn offerings and offerings of our sins, you didn't desire, not have pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he says, behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first to establish the second. So it's this, this, this. 18 verses are really important to follow because he's summarizing everything and closing this last words here. He says, by that will, the will that Christ says, I've come to do your will, O God. He said, by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. What an amazing sentence to learn, right? By that will, God's will was that his son would come to this earth and take our place. That was his will, God's will from the beginning. By that will, he says, we have been sanctified, set apart, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
That's an amazing. So Christ's death fulfilled God's will. That's it. Christ's death fulfilled. Done. That's what he continues saying in, in verses 11 through 18, that Christ's death perfects the sanctified. And that's us. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe in that offering, his body, for you have been sanctified. Now you are perfect before God. Not that you're perfect, that you never sin, and we know that, we, you should know that by now, but that we are complete. Everything has been done. The payment has been paid. We don't have to worry about, you know, the law and, and performing and doing sacrifices and all this other stuff because Christ has done it. His body was that great sacrifice. Now he says, and every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. I mean, can you get more clear than that? He said, but this man, Jesus, he, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, that's another amazing sacrifice. After he had offered one sacrifice for all the sins of the world forever, what did he do? Sat down, representing is done. Like he said in the, on the cross, it is finished. Sat down at the right hand of God, and from that time waiting till his enemy are made his footstool. For by one offering, I mean, he's emphasizing the one offering is greater than all this, all the sacrifices and offering that were done for years and years and years. They can't do it. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And then he says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, before we close, let's look at all the shadows real quick that we have. So we have a clear picture of all the things, you know, Hebrews 10, like I said, those, those, those uh, verses there, it shows you a, a contract between the shadow and the, and the reality. And so we'll see in the shadow where the promise of the good things, while the reality, the reality provides the good things, which is what we have. Now he says, the first one is, in, in I got like seven, really quick we go through them. The first one is that the many sacrifices was the shadow versus the one sacrifice. Verses 11, 3 and 11, and the reality is verses 12 and 14. Number two, those sacrifices, a shadow, were offered, were offered often, Christ sacrificed once. Number three, the, the, the shadow, the sacrifices, those, those sacrifices were imperfect. Christ's sacrifice is perfect. See the shadow there? The, number four, the, the, those, those sacrifices were a reminding versus what Christ did, which it was a complete cleansing. Reminding cleansing. Number five is that what we see in verse 4 and 11, the sacrifices could not. That's the shadow. They could not uh, take away sin while the one sacrifice, the reality, can. They could not. The reality can. And of course, uh, the number six is that the shadow was an outward appearance, basically. It was in all the things involved, killing animals, doing blood, sprinkling the blood, all this stuff was, was physical. The, 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 the reality is inward. That's where we've been sanctified. That's what being, as being renewed day by day. It's not the outward person. Paul says the outward person is dying, it's decaying every single day. Every single day we're decaying. But the inward person is being what? Renew day by day. So we're being sanctified. Remember, we were sanctified, but we're still being sanctified. And I, I explained that before, but that's a basic this is a process. You're being set, set apart for God. When, you, when you're baptized, you're sanctified, but then the start, that's when the process starts. That you start being set apart for God. And the more you learn, the more you read, the more you, you, you pass those uh, basic principles, the elementary principles of Christ, the more sanctified you are. You're a saint, whether you know, you're in the beginning of your baptism or you years from it, you're a saint, but you're being sanctified day by day. 
And that's how your, your, your spirit is renewed. That inner person is renewed day by day. So that's number six. Number seven was the other, the other shadow was a failure. Failure. It failed. Everything that was in the shadow failed. It couldn't. It didn't accomplish the purpose of sanctification, which is in the, the reality is success. Failure, success. That's number seven. And number eight is uh, the shadow was, of course, those, those were temporary but versus the reality, which is forever. We have that right now. So what we have here is uh, in this uh, um, introduction of this lesson, we, we talked about, you know, how this is kind of like the closing words of Paul or the writer, the author uh, of what he was, all the argument he's been building through Hebrews all the way from 1 to, uh, to 9. He's closing here. Uh, and, and now he says that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God until his enemies be made a footstool for his, for his feet. So in chapter, one, in chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, we'll, we'll, read the, we'll read that before we close. But as I always said that chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is an amazing chapter. The most detail about resurrection that you can ever read in the New Testament. But in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, Here's what Paul writes. He said, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. He says, for since by man came death, by man, then he says, by man, by Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, Afterward, those who are in Christ at his coming. I'll give you a real detailed uh, accounting of what's going to happen at the end. Then he says, verse 24, it's 1 Corinthians 15. Then comes the end, he says, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. For he, Christ, must reign Till he has put all enemies under his feet. Same kind of language. I said, and the, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Remember we talked about Christ is our champion. He is our captain because he defeated death. He defeated death. And he gives us the hope that one day we'll be made alive. But we're still dying, right? Well, you know that. We're all still dying. Hebrews 9, 27, we read it, I believe, last week. It's established unto men to die once, and after that, judgment. So, we still, we still being um, hurt by that, and I have to put it in, 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 in as when I say hurt, by death, because we still die physically. But, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Okay, verse 27, for he has put all things under his feet, but when he says, all things are put under him, under Christ, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. So that's God speaking. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So that's, that's it. We have the hope that Christ has given us. We have that one sacrifice offered for sins once and for all. And we have that hope that we, one day, if we're still here, Paul says different in another passage, if, if we're still here, Christ, he says that we'll be changed. We'll be with him in the skies, right? The, the dead in Christ will rise first, will rise first. Then we, if we're still here, will be changed. Different body. So the, those things, when you think about it, are an amazing encouragement. That we, we, we have a purpose. We're going somewhere. I mean, we sing that sometimes. I'm going, I'm going somewhere, right? Or something along those lines. We're going somewhere. We are going somewhere. We are going to meet our Creator face to face. One day. And that's our hope. That's what keeps us moving forward. Because He says, and this is the last verse that we read today. Christ has done it all. And He says, now... Where there is remission of, of these, the sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. 
Christ has done it all, and that's what we remember, what we remember every first day of the week. We remember that sacrifice by doing what Christ says himself, break this bread, partake of this fruit of the vine. An amazing thing, and we, we, have, we have seen that over and over in this book. Christ is superior. Christianity is superior. So if you believe in Christ, you are in the best place you can be in Christ Jesus. That's because you obeyed his voice. You, you not only obey, you believe that he actually did that, that he came to this world, became a human being, and took that awful death that we talked about earlier, he took in our, on our, in our stead. We don't have to experience that. We might experience physical death, but we're not going to experience the spiritual death, that second, that awful second death that we don't want to partake of. So if you're in Christ, you have that hope. Even though, even if we, if we die physically, we're not going to die. That's not death. This is the second death. Talks about it in the book of Revelations. That's the one we don't want to partake on. We want to, we want to, we want to be partakers of the good resurrection. But there's also two resurrections, and one for those that did God's will, obeyed the gospel, know Him, and obeyed the gospel, and one for those who didn't. And that's not, that's not a good one. We don't want to partake here. We don't want anyone that we love, that we know, to partake of that either. So that should motivate us as, as I'm talking to Christians, most of us, right? And we, we also, we, oh, today we are recording, so that should motivate us to, to take this message. It's a simple message of love. It's a simple message of, it's good news. When you get good news, you know, don't you like sharing them? It is good news. We have the hope of eternal life. Uh, we know and we feel it in our hearts that there is a God. That's the first thing you have to know. When you come to Him, you, you must know that He is. That's Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Not only that, but you also, also must know that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So let us ask, ask brothers and sisters in Christ, let us continue to do that. Diligently seek your Creator. Read his words. Get his mind in you. And that will, that will make the world of a difference. So if you're not in Christ, if you know someone that's not in Christ and that person is not here, we'll take this message to them. But if you're here or you're maybe watching and you're not in Christ, well, today, Paul says, today is the day of salvation. We can make free. We can, make, we can be whole, become perfect, set apart, sanctified, holy, to God by doing what? By obeying the gospel. You heard that Christ, that's the gospel, the good news. Christ came to this earth. He died. He was buried and resurrected. And by obeying that, by you dying to sin, being buried with him in baptism and being raised to a new life, you have obeyed the gospel. Now you know God and you have obeyed the gospel. That's the two, those are the two requirements right there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in verses 8 and 9. It says that you have to know God and you have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's only by faith. If, if we do it based on what we do, we're not going to make it. I guarantee you. Every, sing, every single one of us falls short. Every single one of us falls short of the glory of God. So we need Jesus. We need his sacrifice that he offered once and for all. So if you're not in Christ, I encourage you to do, to do that, to think about that. And if you want to obey the gospel, you can do it today if you're here. Well, I do see some faces that I really don't know. So if you're here and you're, and you're in Christ, let's, let's, we can talk more about it if you want to know more about it. But it's all about the gospel. It's about the good news. It's about Jesus obeying his gospel, doing his will. If, if uh, you're somewhere watching this, of course, uh, find a church of Christ in your area. And, and, and they will guide you and tell you what to do. It's easy. Right? But it's so worth it. And for us that are in Christ, stay faithful, seek Him diligently, and remember that He offered Himself. What are we going to do for Him? What are we doing for Him on a daily basis? Are we offering those sacrifices? He is the high priest. We are the priest. We are supposed to be offering living sacrifices every day. Not physical. It's the spiritual sacrifices, praises, living a life that, that shows His love to other people. So if you're in Christ, continue to do that 
and uh, if there's any need whatsoever as well, if you want the church to pray for your needs or something that's going on in your life, something you need help with, please make it known as together we stand and sing.